Welcome to The Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello, it is great to be with you. Today we're going to be talking about how does one go beyond the concept of sort of a one-size-fits-all approach to faith. And I know in episode one, we talked a little bit about how to move past spiritual boredom. And today's episode, we want to kind of expand a little bit on that topic. And I first started thinking about this years ago when I came across a book called Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. And I never really read the entire book, but the premise and the table of concepts really struck me. And I've since then developed the idea. And the basic idea is he suggests that there are nine sacred pathways to God. I think this is just a sample. I think that, you know, it, we're not just limited to nine, but he talks about this idea of ways in which maybe aren't ones that we would normally think of as connecting to God or sort of recognizing that we tend to have natural ways in which the divine makes sense to us in which we interact with God. So let me just briefly mention the different pathways and um, we can kind of go from there. So one is naturalist, and this is someone who loves God outdoors. Next would be a sensate, which is loving God with the senses. Um, so perhaps, um, you know, really engaging in the Eucharist communion because you're tasting it or smelling incense, things like that. Next is traditionalists. This would be loving God through ritual and symbol. Um, so again, some people really enjoy maybe the church calendar, Ash Wednesday, the different holy days, holidays, things like that are ways for them to connect. Next is loving God through aesthetics. And this is um, loving in solitude and simplicity. So um, people that really want to uh, maybe be minimalist, strip down to kind of the bare bo bones basic, fasting would be a way to express that. Next is what he calls activists, loving God through confrontation. I would probably talk about uh, justice, social justice, loving God in, in ways that we could be active in our justice expression. Next is a caregiver, which is loving God by loving others. So any practical ways in which we're walking out our faith would be under that category. Next is enthusiast which is loving God with mystery and celebration. And this is like, maybe if you enjoy singing with a bunch of people, that would be an expression of loving God with um, celebration. Number eight is contemplatives, which is loving God through adoration. And again, this is, you know, people that are maybe drawn to some of the contemplative practices at a monastery or more of the reflective type of aspects of faith. And then the last one is intellectuals, which is loving God with the mind and really enjoying being stimulated in our intellect. And that is a, a pathway to the divine. Thank you. That is a helpful list, I think. Um, and you're right. There are, I once, I found a test, which we can link to in the comments that gives, I think, maybe 10 or 18 or <laughs> something between 10 and 18 uh, of all these different categories. Uh, but I have found this idea so helpful even before I really understood what it was. So back in my maybe mid twenties, I had a woman I was interacting with and she was so into color, like in ways I had never contemplated color. I had in the opera world, a lot of times the value was on a black dress, just something neutral, very businessy, formal, uh, but she could see colors and she got words and colors and they meant something to her. And when she put them together, it was this whole thing. And so I was watching her and a little bit baffled and a little bit intrigued. And so that was kind of my first foray into this. And then life moves on and there'd be people who would say like, I just got to get out and I've got to get on my bicycle and I've got to go for this big trek through the woods. And I thought that sounds dangerous. Like, I don't like, but they would tell me that they felt like that's how they connected with God. So I was on to this and then what that meant for myself definitely felt more challenging to pin down. In fact, even when I took the test, I think I shared with you, Christina, like, there's like two or three that are very obvious no's. Like naturalist is not my thing, <laughs> too many bugs. Uh, but a lot of them will get uh, kind of equal scores from there. But words, as I really reflected on it, I love words. And that has been 
true forever. Like I would write poetry when I was in my angsty teenage years and trying to work out my emotions, <laughs> even before I understood gifting and all that jazz. Uh, but even now, like if I were to sit down and do a contemplative, I would love to write. I would love to like earlier in another episode, I talked about chanting, be still and know that I am God. I would equally love sitting with the word be and writing out everything that comes to mind on the word be and still and the whole bit. So words are just this lovely thing and I can sing them and I can read them. It doesn't matter. I could listen to them. Words make me so happy. That's interesting. Uh, I think what comes up for me is, you know, like there's a list of pathways I think we gravitate towards one or two. I think landing on several or multiple would actually open us up to experience life uh, more fully. And I was listening to a podcast the other day and the, the whole premise was on focusing. Uh, he was, the, the person who was giving the podcast was talking about being on a trip in the Galapa, Galapagos Islands and there's these sunfish that, that come out. Uh, he was you know, told by the guide, if you look really closely, you can see these sunfish sort of break the plane of the water and you can see their fins and it almost looks like sharks. And so uh, he encouraged them to look to find these sunfish. And so he was uh, one of a few people in the boat. Before he knew it, he was, he was seeing these fish in the water uh, and they were breaking the plane. And, and he was like, look over there, look on that side. And then a moment later, look on that side, there's, there's one. And, and he noticed that he was the only one in the boat spotting the fish. And he relates this to being an angler. And he's so used to focusing on fish and this, this aspect of a fish breaking the plane of water. And I think sometimes in our life, if we get too focused on the one thing, we miss what is going on around us. And so I like that there's a list. I would feel like I would want to explore many of them. And maybe that's uh, because I'm an adventurous person I, and, and I want to explore everything, every path. Um, but that's what comes to mind to me is like, uh, I think our tendency is, is to want to like narrow it down and focus and like, that's my path. I would caution that if that's your only one path, then, you know, you're going to, to probably miss out on all the wonderful paths that lead to different places in life. Yeah. And I think when I, again, I didn't read the book, but when I first interacted with the concept, so I, I probably wasn't as drawn to the list and even some of his language, I didn't necessarily jive with. Uh, but I think it really has helped me even in how I structure contemplative retreats and just recognizing that it's really helpful to have a variety of different ways within the day of a retreat that people can engage because you're right. People come in with very different ideas of what it means or natural ways. And so Christina, to your point with, you know, words and scripture and so offering maybe multiple different ways in which people can, because I think for some people, it's like, I want to have a scripture that I can, if I, we're going on a morning reflection time solo, I want to have a scripture that I can look to and reflect on, which is great. And so, um, have that. But for other people, I might have art supplies and you can go do some art supplies and, and have fun with that or um, encouraging people different nature things. And it's always wonderful when we come back after lunch and talk about how we spent some of our personal time in the mornings, just to see the variety of ways, even within the particular, if there was a scripture or a reflection or the art supplies, the ways in which people are coming up with things, it's so beautiful and unique. And so I really appreciate, again, the expansiveness that this concept offers. I love it. And I started thinking about that too, even in structuring services, like it just started to become clear. Some people need to be active and some people don't want to be active at all. <laughs> so even at one point we put together uh, an exercise service, an arts service, a pub service where there was more like chatting and community activity, it, you know, and then that was a lot of services to be running. So then we started to just try different things in the context of a service. And I had a friend in the education industry because they think about these things. And she was like, you know, you're, you're naturally doing this kind of universal design learning thing where you think about how different people's brains work, how their bodies need to move and you're just naturally doing it. I was like, that's right. That's what we're doing. <laughs> we did that on purpose. But there is some instinctive, if you're listening to people talk, 
you start to catch on. Like, yes, people interact with the world differently. Yeah, and I would say probably a, a book that's been really instrumental to me is the book called Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. And the book is typically used in the context of either parent-child relationships, significant other romantic relationships. But I think it applies spiritually as well because it speaks to the idea of how we give and receive love in different ways. Uh, the five love languages described are acts of service, so doing practical things for people, quality time, which can be either doing an activity or having quality conversation with another person, gift giving, so it doesn't have to be large, but just even small gifts that you're giving to another person, physical touch, or even physical proximity. Um, and then the fifth one is words of encouragement. And I think as it relates to our spirituality, I think that there are natural ways in which we tend to give and receive love from God as well. And so for one person, maybe serving is like you feel close to God when you are somehow volunteering or giving energy in that way that that's really meaningful to you. Um, maybe for others, spending a lot of time in the Bible is important because words are a big deal. And so that is how you're receiving words of encouragement from Jesus is through scripture and some of the Psalms, things like that, as well as giving words back through prayer. Um, or maybe if physical touch is important to you, you maybe enjoy the more embodied type of worship that sometimes the liturgical churches tend to offer. And so I personally have found a lot of uh, juice from that concept of the love languages. Again, of course, our human relationships, but definitely as it relates to God as well. Yeah, I like the the concept of, of love languages as we think of relating to God and, uh, you know, thinking about, okay, how do I how do I interact with God? What is, what is my mode of operation? And so it's been, it's been really important for me to, to think about, okay, I really feel like I'm loved by God. I I'm out in nature and I, I actually have a sense of his presence out there. So that, you know, that quality time it, it, and it's, and it, you know, it, it's not just for some people, it could be like whenever they're spending time in the Bible, uh, that that's a quality time with God. But for me, I find when I'm out in nature or I'm playing my guitar and there's this like this proximity to God. So quality time, understanding that has been really helpful in, in my relationship to divine. And, and who doesn't like getting gifts? I think other people prefer getting gifts uh, or giving gifts, but uh, who doesn't like getting gifts? I love it when God drops these nuggets in my lap of whether it is a word of encouragement or, you know, somebody says, Oh, I was thinking of you. And I, I just wanted to give this to you or, or whatever. So yeah, I, I, I find it helpful thinking about love languages as we relate to the divine. Which is interesting because um, gift giving is probably a lower one for me. And I've had to learn that over the years, but it's interesting in thinking about that with God, because I think a lot of times people they're looking for, a tangible blessing from God. And that is how they know their love from God. If God is blessing them in a certain way. And I think for others where maybe that's not your natural bent, that can seem off-putting like, well, why do you need a blessing from God or some tangible thing to prove that God loves you? Um, and sometimes I think there can be some rub, but if we step back and recognize, oh, like that's actually a way in which you tend to give and receive love. I think it frames it a little bit differently. Yeah. Yeah. And I also like adding all these little nuances can be very helpful because if I'm looking at the sacred pathway stuff and that word traditionalist comes up as, oh, you like ritual, you know, those rhythms. And I think, no, that's not true. I don't like that part at all, but I do like going for instance, to a service. And I think once I looked at it through the lens of the love languages, I understood because it's like quality time for me. It's that one-on-one -on -one time set aside. We get to be together and that lights me up. So these funny little nuances where you might've said, oh, I'm not this because that word doesn't fit me. But then you get to see it from this other angle and go, oh, that's, that makes more sense to me why I would enjoy that. 
Yeah. And I like that because I think it ties in also, we had talked about personalities in an earlier episode. And I think, you know, each of these different things, if the three of us, even on this podcast had a, had a similar thing in which we connected, it would probably look very differently because of our personalities. And so even for, for me, my rhythm of, I love going um, on a retreat once a quarter. So that rhythm and tradition is much more meaningful to me as a quality time, as a contemplative, as an introvert versus maybe the weekly rhythm of a church service, which um, I'm guessing, you know, Christina, I know Chris really appreciates that weekly rhythm of being with people, um, maybe some of that extrovert energy and that um, sort of frequency of rhythm as well. So I think, like you're saying, the nuances and all of these things tying in together, um, I think just continue to inform us of, yep, we're all, um, we live in a culture too, where you can go to Starbucks and order a bajillion different drinks because the options are endless. Or, you know, we have Spotify playlists where everybody can kind of have their own individualized expression of music. And um, I think that there's some real benefit to leaning into that. While also we had mentioned in our personality episode about the shadow side and making sure that sometimes we're stretched a little bit. And so I think the beauty of looking at some of these different uh, concepts okay, what are some ways that maybe I haven't experienced that? And what would it look like for me to maybe explore a new territory like you're talking about, Chris, and stretching myself a little bit and maybe discovering that, wow, there's something here that I really needed that I didn't realize that I needed at the time. Yes, because take that whole color thing, right? My, there were so many reasons for why I wasn't engaging with color, right? Like there had never been opportunity even. A lot of my things had been hand-me-downs. So I had never contemplated what color I wanted. Like the towels in my bathroom were the color that we received as a gift. And my clothes were the color that someone gave me and, or they were black because it was for performance or something. So it was only as I was able to take more like charge in my life a little bit that I'm going to intentionally add color and look how fun this is and look how bright and happy this makes me. So yes, I think there's this opportunity for growth and exploration of things as we're introduced to them. Well, great. So we encourage everyone to consider uh, maybe checking out some of these resources and just continuing to look for ways in which we can move past a one size fits all approach to faith and really find some ways that um, continue to nourish our souls. And now we are going to transition to the part of the podcast where we talk about what we're into this week. Um, okay. So again, I think I'm into the funniest little things. It's all about what's bringing me joy. And this week it is bringing me so much joy to intentionally put on my necklaces and earrings because, <laughs> because pandemic and like we had been really sick back in November. And so I had spent a lot of time in just pajamas and then it was this slow roll to get back into things. And so the, over the last few days, I've been intentionally matching my jewelry to my outfit and it's making me very happy. <laughs> nice. I like that. Um, for me, I am into by way of my daughter. So I have a 13 year old who's really into music and she kind of rotates through whatever she's interested in. And so this week, the Beatles has been highlighted in our household. And so um, I am into the Beatles. And, you know, we are not just into let's listen to a Beatles song, but I think my daughter has some, uh, she loves to research and learn about things. And so it's like, why did John and Paul have fights? The impact of Yoko Ono on the band what was the best selling album so we've been really immersed in the Beatles this week which has been um really fun and interesting and on a side note uh actually when Chris and I before we were dating um we were on a trip together to the UK and we had an opportunity to go to the Beatles museum in Liverpool uh so it's been kind of fun recalling some of the uh different aspects of our fun pre-engagement pre-falling in loveness stage of our lives it's been a family affair. So I, I've enjoyed the Beatles as well, but I've enjoyed it from a different angle. I drive our children to school in the morning. And so we've been listening to uh, different Beatles songs and talking about the ones that we like the most. And so I've been having fun saying, what, what do you think the song is about? You know, what, you know, one, one of the songs that I'm like, have you ever heard that, uh, you know, that 
maybe there was a, an aversion to anyone with a handicap, any type of handicap. Yeah, I read that he didn't like that or whatever. And I'm like, uh, what, do, what do you hear as some of the, the theme, the elements in this song? So we've been geeking out on uh, Beatles music as we drive to school. Uh, we, we carpool. And so the neighbors that, that drive to school with us are in, in the backseat rolling their eyes, really wanting us to move on to something else. So I need to, I need to find my way into something new. That is awesome. <laughs> and there you have it. Well, thanks so much for joining us. As always, we encourage you to check out the contemplativelife.net for more resources and we'll see you again next week. Take care. <laughs>